out. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the October uh, Scholar Share. Uh, today, we're going to have two fabulous speakers and an amazing moderator uh, uh, for our talk. Uh, so uh, before we start, please sign in, uh, grab some food, and uh, enjoy. Uh, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today's event. Uh, is Dr. Kristen Betts. Uh, she's a clinical professor in the School of Education here at Drexel University. Uh, Dr. Vet, uh, Betts has about uh, 20 years of experience in higher education and has served as a, as a key leadership position uh, within private, public, and um, for-profit uh, institutions. Dr. Betts' expertise is in online blending and uh, uh, learning curriculum and instructional design and evaluation. Um, her research focuses on mind, brain, and education science, um, brain-targeted teaching, online uh, human touch, uh, student faculty retention, and faculty development. Uh, Dr. Betts is a Fulbright specialist, um, a quality mat uh, matters peer uh, reviewer, and an instructor with the Online Learning Consortium certificate uh, programs. Dr. Vretz, uh it's a grant reviewer for, um, for the Hong Kong Grand uh, Council and has been a reviewer for 13 journals and publishing companies. Uh, Dr. Betts has been a keynote speaker at conferences and government supported events in Sweden, um, South Korea, Canada, and across the United States. Please let's welcome Dr. Betts. Well, thank you for that very warm welcome. And it's wonderful to see so many of you here today. So I have the pleasure of presenting two speakers today. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Galoyan. Um, and I had the privilege of working with her over the last four years as a doctoral student in the School of Education. So Dr. Galoyan is a postdoctoral scholar in the School of Education at Drexel University. She earned her PhD in Educational Leadership in Learning Technologies. She is a co-founder of eLabs, which is Education, Learning, and Brain Sciences Research Consor uh, uh, Collaborative. Uh, she's also a co-editor of Evie. And if you're not familiar with that journal, I encourage you to learn more. It is for students and it is led by students, and it's a great opportunity for you to publish. So Tamara holds a master's degree in teaching English as a foreign language from the American University of Armenia. She has a master's degree in linguistics from uh, Yerevan State Linguistic University. She has many, many research interests, and so she is focusing on the neurocognitive, behavioral, and social factors affecting learning, problem solving, retention, and transfer of learning. She's also working with some of the top researchers in her field, which is really exciting. She's looking at education across all modalities, including on-site, online, and blended learning. She has a decade of experience in teaching English as a foreign language to adult learners and college students of very diverse backgrounds, both in Armenia and across the United States. And she has been involved in online, blended and on-site course development, assessment, testing, curriculum design, training, and mentoring. So it is with my great pleasure that I get to present Dr. Galoyan. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the detailed <laughs> presentation of my, my background. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all here, and thank you for your time. I know how busy you are now <laughs> with your classes and other work, but I really appreciate that you were able to come and attend these presentations. 
Um, so I'll just start with, um, today I'm going to talk about my dissertation study that, uh, that is entitled Multidisciplinary Investigation into Neurocognitive Basis of Problem Solving Transfer with Implications for Pedagogy and Instructional Design. So this was a mixed method study um, that I conducted at Drexel University as part of my dissertation. However, today I'm going to focus on mostly on the quantitative phase um, of the study because I feel like we, don't, we won't have enough time to go through uh, both studies. So um, firstly, let me tell you a little bit about my research interests. In my first year as a doctoral student, I was working in, um, on different projects related to game-based learning and gaming uh, and gamification. Uh, later on, my research interests a little bit changed and I got interested in um, online blended uh, and on-site learning. And uh, I started collaborating with different researchers and when I started working with my amazing supervisor, Dr. Bet, so I had the opportunity to meet and collaborate with researchers from different disciplinary areas and also take elective courses from different disciplines in cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience. And that's how I shaped my research interest as a researcher. I wanted to focus on, a, I wanted to conduct an interdisciplinary investigation and um, the topic that I chose to focus on is transfer of problem solving. You know, transfer of learning and problem solving is a really, it cuts across disciplines and it's relevant in, to any area. Um, uh, so transfer has been defined as a term that describes a situation where information learned at one point in time uh, can be applied to um, a different context. So it's, um, in, in other words, it's, learning in one context and trying to apply that context across uh, uh, multiple other similar contexts. Um, and I'm not going through the, all the definitions here. <laughs> um, so uh, one issue with problem solving transfer research relates, uh, so I identified three major issues in literature. Uh, one of them relates to the complex neurocognitive mechanisms at play. So when I was uh, reading literature in education, in neuroscience, in cognitive psychology, all, all of the, the scholars who focused on transfer talked about transfer from different angles, from different perspectives, and they identified different issues related to transfer of problem solving. So I tried to summarize the issues discussed in literature. And um, I focused on these three uh, issues, complex neurocognitive mechanisms, the different conceptualizations that exist in literature related to problem solving transfer and designing instruction to enhance transfer across different instructional modalities, including on-site, online and blended learning. So the purpose of my dissertation study was to investigate neurocognitive, behavioral, and task factors that are involved in problem solving transfer. And also, I, that, that was my quantitative part, quantitative phase of the study. The second uh, phase, the qualitative phase, focused on exploring how university faculty conceptualized and enhanced transfer at Drexel University across disciplines. And of course, the a uh, goal was to, I'm sorry, the goal was to uh, come up with some practical recommendations and some implications for future research and also um, some practices that could in enhance transfer, potentially enhance transfer in higher education. So I was focusing on four broad research questions. Um, you see them on the screen. And um, so uh, I used uh, three broad literature streams that informed my current study. Uh, that was mind, brain, and education sciences literature, transfer of learning literature, and cognitive load theory. So mind, brain, and education sciences uh, focus on um, using brain research uh, and designing informed pedagogical practices to enhance learning. Uh, transfer of learning literature in, that I synthesized relates to different conceptualizations, different models, taxonomies that I investigated. And cognitive load theory uh, is fo um, focusing on the design of instruction uh, that could potentially enhance 
learning. So like combining these three areas I felt would be a strong foundation for me, um, would provide a strong the theoretical framework, but as well as strong foundation to design uh, brain-friendly learning environments in the future. Uh, so this is just the model. Um, uh, this is the scheme of my uh, study. So you see I con conducted a convergent mixed methods design uh, study and it uh, consisted of quantitative and qualitative phases and I'm not going through the details. If you are interested, I can ask questions about these slides, uh, but I'm going to talk more specifically about some aspects of this. Uh, so my quantitative research was an experimental study that I conducted um, at Drexel's Concord Lab. And this, um, so I was able to collaborate with researchers from biomedical engineering, from neuroscience, and uh, this really helped me to uh, get the training to use brain imaging technologies to conduct, to set up and conduct an experiment as well as analyze and report the data. So my target population were graduate students from the School of Education, College of Arts and Sciences, Lebo College of Business, and School of Biomedical Engineering, Science and Health Systems. So I had four colleges that I focused on. And um, so I, firstly, before conducting my main study, I conducted a pilot study with um, uh, six uh, students. And after that, I was able to conduct the main study, which involved 27 graduate students. Um, I had like roughly equal male and female participants and the average age group 18 to 40 years old. So before starting the experiment, uh, the participants received uh, a survey, uh, an online survey that they were asked to complete. And this survey uh, collected some uh, baseline uh, information on different characteristics of my participants. Those included personal information like um, educational background and uh, uh, age, gender, special visualization tests that I used because uh, literature showed that special visualization skills relate to special navigation. And that's the game that I designed for this study, which I will talk about a little bit later. And creative self-efficacy test, um, just a few items, like five, I think it included just five items where learners were asked to uh, rate their perceived uh, creativity, creative self-efficacy. Um, so this is the, uh, as part of my dissertation study, I was collaborating with an engineer and we designed a special navigation game uh, and this is the structure of the game. So the game construct, um, com consisted of two types of problems, well-structured problems and ill-structured problems. Uh, well-structured problems are the problems that have clear, definite solution and have clear steps and procedures that you have to undergo to uh, reach a solution. Whereas ill-structured problems are wicked problems. So there is no clear cut um, strategies to um, reach a solution. They, there can be actually multiple solutions or no solution at all maybe. Uh, and this involved the creativity part of um, uh, problem solving, creative problem solving component. Uh, however, I was not specifically focusing on creative problem solving. It's just problem solving in general. Um, so for well-structured problems, I had two scenarios, school bus problem and ambulance problem. And uh, I'll talk about this. And uh, ill-structured problems uh, consisted of two uh, open-ended questions that the participants were asked to simply generate as many possible solutions, as many solutions as possible uh, to the proposed scenarios. So this is the screenshot of the school bus problem. You see that it's, uh, um, it's a school bus and the learners are asked to navigate the map and collect the students from different locations of the map and bring them back to school. Uh, however, there are certain constraints that the players have to overcome in order to uh, collect all the students. For example, in this on this screenshot, you see that there is a limited number of seating. They can carry only three students at a time. And there is a limited amount of fuel. So with each step, the fuel decreases. So you really have to make calculations and be careful um, not to run out of fuel, for example, because in that case, you will fail the game. Um, 
So the next scenario is an ambulance scenario. Here, the uh, players assumed the role of an ambulance driver, and they had to navigate the map, collect the patients. So they receive a call and collect patients from different locations of the map. And again, there are certain number of uh, challenges that they have to overcome to reach the destination, which is the hospital here. And uh, uh, here, you see that there is limited amount of time. So this, this one is timed, unlike the school bus problem, which was not timed. So they have limited amount of time, limited amount of fuel. They have traffic, which is increasing. So uh, that uh, adds to the complexity uh, of the game. Uh, and they can carry only one patient at a time this time. Um, this is a video, just a very brief video that I can play. You can. Let me see if it's playing. Yeah, there is no sound, so I don't need the sound. Um, so this is the overall experiment. They start with a tutorial. So once they log into the game uh, using their IDs, that the Drexel. Uh, users, they are provided with instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to navigate the game. And you see that there are certain in intersections look, uh, highlighted that they need just to click, just to familiarize themselves with the game mechanics. Uh, yeah, and you can see they move, uh, so they, they have instructions at every step. Uh, and it's really very quick and simple tutorial that based on the participant feedback, especially from the pilot study, um, was apparently useful for the players. Uh, then uh, before starting each uh, difficulty level, there were three difficulty levels, low cognitive load tasks, medium cognitive load tasks, and high cognitive load tasks. And I op operationalized the difficulty levels based on the number of constraints that they had to overcome. And you see that, um, so the learners do not necessarily start with low, then go to mid and high. So it was randomized and some players would start with a high cognitive load task and then medium cognitive load task and then proceed to the low. So it was really randomized. That's for the, due to the nature of the experimental design. Uh, and this is the ambulance screenshot. You see they, again, they scroll down, they, they see how many constraints they have to overcome, how they can effectively navigate the game, then they start the game and play. So the players had, uh, the op if they fail the game, they have the opportunity to repeat the same task a second time. Um, so this gave me, as a researcher, an opportunity to observe and see whether uh, they will improve their performance. And the performance was measured in terms of reaction time, total time and accuracy, uh, total time spent on the task. And reaction time was the time that it takes, like in milliseconds, I was able to measure the time that it takes the player to make the first move, uh, make, make this first move, the decision to make the first move. Um, and I included that information in the statistical analysis. And this is the screenshot of the ill-structured problems. You see they are presented with a problem scenario. There were of two complexity levels, a complex scenario and a um, relatively simple scenario. And they had to add their solutions um, uh, in separate text boxes. And so um, this, I was able to collect both behavioral data uh, which was participants performance, uh, total time, reaction time and uh, uh, accuracy. And I was also able to measure their brain activity while they were playing, uh, solving problems, playing the game. So uh, this was done by using the FNIRS, which is functional near infrared spectroscopy brain imaging technology that was developed at Drexel. And I was collaborating uh, with one of the developers of FNIRS, Dr. Zotoglu from biomedical engineering. And he helped me to, he trained me and helped me to set up the experiment as well as Dr. Shivorkis from, um, College of Nursing and Public Health and affiliated with Biomed. Uh, so you see, this is, this is a very simple device. Um, it is portable, it is uh, safe, and the users um, 
uh, wear the handband, which, which is able to track activation. Um, thank you. Which is able to track activation in their prefrontal cortex area, which is responsible for executive functioning. That's the area that is responsible for problem solving. And uh, since problem solving was the focus, I didn't use. Um, of course, I could enhance this study by using other types of technology or maybe combining GFNIRS with other brain imaging technologies, but I kept it simple <laughs> for my dissertation work, maybe in the future. Um, and yeah, and I was also able to collect data on the perceived difficulty of the task. So it was not only the uh, objective measures, which is FNIRS um, of brain activity, but also learners perceived difficulty of the task which they were asked to read and I've used NASA TLX, a uh, very famous uh, instrument that they used, to, especially for pilots, I think they used it a lot, um, airplane pilots, I mean. Um, so this, this is a skill they were asked to read. Their brain. And this, uh, this is the screenshot of some of my subjects from the pilot study. <laughs> I guess you recognize <laughs> one of my subjects. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, just some screenshots of my participants. Mm. And uh, I conducted like, statistical analysis. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with numbers. You can see that I was able to uh, find uh, significant effects across all the models, statistical models that I developed. So all of them were significant. If you see the table, um, so, which is exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's it. So, um, since I don't have much time to talk about my qualitative part, uh, I'll just sum up by saying that this investigation, the quantitative phase of my study, really helped me to understand how different task manipulations can affect players and learners. Uh, brain activity and how this information can be used to confirm behavioral data that you collect or complement. So in my case, it complemented the uh, neural data that I collected, complemented and supported the behavioral data that I collected. Um, however, in some cases, it could have contradicted. Um, thank you. Thank you for attending my presentation. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask them now or maybe after. I don't know if we have a it's not, right not, not right now. Not right now. Yeah. And we can, maybe Elaine can present. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I want to thank Tamara for her wonderful presentation. As you can see, it was very detailed. So I have the honor as well as uh, presenting Dr. Elaine Karen Ya. She is a postdoctoral research scholar in the College of Arts and Sciences at Drexel University. I will say we are very lucky because she does hail from the School of Education where she earned her PhD in leaders, educational leadership and learning technologies with a concentration in STEM. She holds a master's degree in education from Temple University, a BSBA from the University of Pittsburgh. Her broader research interests focus on creativity and she does a lot of research with Dr. Katz and other wonderful researchers at Drexel University. Uh, she focuses on interdisciplinary education, arts integrated learning. She has successfully published several articles on creativity and arts integration in STEM learning. She has over 15 years of experience in developing and teaching interdisciplinary courses. And this is some of the work she, that she's doing now for undergraduates, and she's doing this now on the graduate level. She's currently helping to design a new graduate minor at Drexel that emphasizes creative problem solving through interdisciplinary team based research. I am very proud to say that both of them, Tamara and Elaine are award winners from the School of Education and were recognized for their outstanding research last year. So thank you so much and you'll get to hear again from another amazing researcher. Just before Dr. Betts has to leave, so we're just gonna say thank you for being the moderator today. And um, can we give her a, a round of applause? <laughs>
All right, here we go. Um, hi, thanks again for, for sticking around and please help yourself to food. Um, as uh, similar to Toma, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my dissertation research, but trying to kind of fly through it a little bit more, we only about 10 minutes. So um, <clears throat> I'll kind of explain creativity, my research on that and kind of go from there. Uh, so, no. Oh no, it doesn't like me. Really? I have more slides, okay. Um, so just to start off, this idea of creativity, right? A lot of questions I get from, from students and other researchers is, what is creativity and how can you even research it? So most of the time, the answers I get for what is creativity is people align it with arts, arts and design, or creative problem solving. You heard Tom kind of talk about that. Um, or even just this genius way of thinking and that it's, there's creative people or creatives out there in the world. What creativity really is, is, is more of a way of thinking. Think of it as just a regular cognitive um, way of thinking. It's a habit of mind. It is teachable and it is practicable. Other ways to think of it is um, in terms of Coffin and Baghetto basically broke it down into four C's. And so this idea of big C is probably what most people are familiar with in terms of notable figures, um, Albert Einstein, Da Vinci, um, I had not a lot of time on this, so I really wanted to pull up some, some females that I did not, but big C people uh, in George O'Keefe, um, Susan B. Anthony, other notable figures, people that we all recognize, right? We all would say that they are creative thinkers, that they have done innovative things in this world. Pro C is something where, like our president at the university, where they're using creativity to kind of solve these ill-structured problems in the world or to kind of come across things and, and um, think in ways no one else really has done in order to be innovative. Little c is kind of where it gets into our realm of, of research. Think of um, your dissertations as a little c that you are thinking of um, your problem finding, you're thinking of problems in new ways that other people have it, you're kind of finding holes and gaps. Um, you are even making cognitive connections in your mind that no one else really has. So that's a little bit little c. And the mini c is even much smaller than that. And it's something that is new to you. So maybe you came across a novel book. Um, and so it may not be a novel book to someone else, but it's novel to you. So that's just kind of the really small everyday stuff. Real quickly too, another way that researchers look at and research creativity is with the four P's. And so Rhodes explains that essentially creativity has been and can be researched in the person. So think cognition, think creative personalities in the product. So think about like inventions, um, output, creative output, the process. So you've heard of like the creative problem solving process, creative thinking processes, and then play in the environment. And obviously that's where, where does creativity occur? What are certain inspirational settings, that type of thing. The definition that I have used, I think is all encompassing, is that creativity is the uh, interaction among aptitude, process, and environment by which an individual group produces a perceptible product that is both novel and useful as defined within a social context. So you can see that that's kind of all encompassing and the keywords here are really novel and useful. So you can have a novel idea, but if it's not useful, it's not really creative. And that's how um, both researchers and society have kind of come to recognize a creative idea to categorize it that way. Uh, and so getting a little bit more into my research, my PhD is in education. And so I wanted to look at creativity and can we learn it? How is it learned? How are students um, enhancing their creative thinking skills and how do teachers teach it? So it does depend on personal mindset, worldviews, motivations to do so. So you can enhance your creative thinking abilities if you want to, if you set out to do so, essentially. And it's like any other skill. If I was to teach you how to play basketball, I could teach you uh, the, um, the rules of the game, the, the materials used, how to dribble, how to shoot. Are you gonna make it to the NBA? Probably not, maybe not, maybe so. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't learn how to play. So that's kind of how I perceive creativity and how I kind of convey that to my students as well. What we know so far from all of these researchers and more down here is that we can learn to develop the creative thinking skills. It is based on our basic knowledge and understanding. So that's where school comes into play. You have to have basic understanding of how certain disciplines and domains work before you can be creative in those areas. 
Um, you need motivation to be creative, and so that's support sometimes from educators, from peers, from parents. Um, you know, you need approval to fail. Uh, if we have any engineers in the room, the engineering process is a lot about failure. Try again, try again, try again. And that's where creative ideas come from too. A lot of the notable figures that are these, the big C creative thinkers fail a lot and they failed often to get to where they are. So jumping into my research here is where I was looking at this link between teachers implicit um, concepts and theories of creativity and how they link with their behaviors in the classroom. And without getting too much into the research and the muddy waters of it, there's a lot of research that shows that the way we see the world, our concepts and ideas about things impact our behaviors, right? And that's kind of, you know, I guess kind of hopefully under, easy to understand that the way we think about things, the way that we perceive others impacts our actions. And so the same holds true for teachers and how they foster creativity in the classroom. Um, and so what I sought out to do is a, uh, it's a case study mixed methods. It's a small sample, but it was bounded within one class, one class setting. Um, and it was, it was a fifth grade STEAM classroom. And again, without getting too much into my dissertation background, looking at the arts integration into STEM in particular, when I was looking at the creativity enhancement of it, which is why it's bounded by the STEAM classroom, fifth grade. Um, and I observed 18 classes over one semester. So it was these six teachers that I observed to try to understand both their implicit um, theories of creativity and then their actions and how they encourage it in the classroom. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this mixed methods approach, my quantitative data collection, this is one piece of it. Um, it is a valid and reliable, basically a Likert scale survey. It measures nine different factor areas, again, bounded by, grounded in research, that these are the ways to uh, help to foster creativity. And if you have questions, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Um, so each teacher completed the survey, the beginning of my study, and then I essentially used this also as observational protocol. And during each of those 18 classes would go in and essentially rate them and observe how the teachers are acting and interacting with students and rate them. So I could use my survey results kind of compared with their survey results. The qualitative component is um, my individual interviews with the teachers and then the observation field notes again from those 18 classes. And similar to Toma, I'm gonna kind of jump through some of these numbers really fast. Uh, and so these are just the means, um, and again, if we have time after or later or whatever, um, but I wanted to look at the means of the self-rated, so it's how the teachers observe themselves and then my observation ratings. And um, the basic takeaway here is that a lot of their observation scores were much lower than their own personal um, self-assessments. And then here I did a, an intercorrelation matrix. Nothing was significant, um, which is not surprising because it's a small sample. And then here is how I went through and coded it. And so the qualitative component of coding was reading through all the interviews, all the observations, um, the in vivo quotes on the right-hand side, but the left hand side here is I deductively coded it using those nine factors from the same um, matrix that they took the survey on so that everything was really aligned across the board. And this is essentially in mixed methods when you combine everything together and where some key factors and key things start to pop up. So you want to look at what's converging and what is diverging among your findings. And so I've got quantitative on the left hand side, qualitative results on the right hand side. Um, some of the key takeaways here is that self-rated, as I mentioned earlier, interestingly, they all rated themselves very high. Their means are very high. They think very highly of their abilities to foster creativity in the classroom, which is not surprising. Um, the observations show slightly sl smaller means, um, and then a couple of areas that fell in the moderate range. And more interesting is on the qualitative side, there's three factors that showed up as high, but they, I mean, they showed up high here as well. So across the board, uh, independence, integration opportunities, I'll explain that in a second, what those are. But those were showing high across the board, which is kind of an interesting um, result there. And then lastly, that there are four uh, factor areas that, that showed up low. 
on the qualitative results, which means that they came out in the interviews and the observations, but they didn't necessarily show up in the survey. So that was kind of curious as well. So some of my key results here um, is one is that the teachers and researchers are in agreement. And let's see if I can go back to this one. Meaning that across the board, independence and integration opportunities were all high across the board. And the reason why this is significant, why this is important, is that in a lot of previous research, um, the way that teachers rate themselves is often in disagreement and disalignment with how researchers rate teachers' actions in, behavior, in, the, in the classroom. And so the fact that I had three factors across the board that were aligned is kind of interesting. It's kind of significant and potentially provide some real evidence that they are in fact acting this way and they are in fact using these three factors to foster creativity. Um, and real quickly, so independence is basically encouraging students to think independently, so not be so dependent on the teacher. Integration is a lot of working with peers, doing teamwork, group work in positive ways. And then opportunities is where teachers are providing a lot of opportunities for students to use different materials, to think in different ways, um, even changing classes, classrooms, environments, changing with whom they work. So a lot of kind of changing things up, not the same old, same old. So the second key result here is that there's possible misconceptions. I say possible for a reason. Motivation, judgment, evaluation, and question. And so back to kind of this key chart here, I said possible misalignment because um, in the interviews and the observations, they showed up very low. And interestingly, they showed up very high or higher on the quantitative side. And so that kind of spoke to me when I looked back into the interview data that while some of these teachers may be using or may think that they're using some of these behaviors, as far as motivation is essentially um, uh, encouraging students to, to master foundational knowledge. Judgment is withholding judgment, so allowing students to just think and be creative. Evaluation is promoting self-evaluation, and then questions, again, promoting, um, allowing students to ask questions, to challenge ideas. And so teachers might feel that they're doing those things, but they may not be purposeful in terms of fostering creativity. And so an example of that, do I have one on here? don't. Um, so an example of that might be that they encourage self, student self-evaluation. So they're saying, yes, we do encourage student self-evaluation. We have them do self-evaluations in terms of their, um, their projects, and then we, they tell us what grade they think they earned or what they did well. But they're still using it for grading. And the idea of self-evaluation is removing the teacher out of that, allowing students to determine for themselves if it is a creative product, to determine for themselves the level of quality and to determine for themselves if they are even done this project. Um, you know, think of your papers, think of your art projects. If you've done anything, you're like, is it done? It's up to you to decide. It's not up to the teacher to decide. So a little bit of a misalignment there. And I know I'm running out of time. Um, and so the, the key takeaway really is just this looking into how their conceptions, how they think they're behaving in the classroom versus how they're actually acting in the classroom um, can really kind of, is really important to how students are then are developing their creativity. So the next piece of this is really um, something that I want to look into is determining now that we're looking at the behaviors that teachers are using in the classroom, um, are students actually enhancing their creativity, right? So that's kind of the next piece is to then do some research with students, um, which is my current research. I'm looking at now how students are actually increasing their creativity. And that is the end of this, but I do want to put in a last plug. Um, so as Dr. Beth mentioned, I am a postdoctoral student here, and um, I've helped to design a graduate minor, and you can take this course the winter as an elective term, or as an elective course, um, it's called Enhancing the Creativity of Research Projects. It's interdisciplinary team taught. So there's multiple professors from across the university that are team teaching in. You'll be ideally working on teams, working on your own research, or working on new research projects with students that are in other disciplinaries as well. And um, the idea is that it's going to help you uh, promote your creative thinking, creative problem solving, that again, will kind of connect back to your own research. So that's my last plug. Thank you. Well, let's thank both of the speakers. If anybody has 
any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. The speakers are here uh, for another five to 10 minutes. Um, so we're opening the floor for any questions, maybe online, if there are any questions. Anyone? So this, uh, thank you for sharing all of your wonderful research. I, um, this is a sort of a, a high level question, um, just to touch all folks in the room and, and including myself as a professional staff member. Um, what led you to decide to go on to a postdoc? Um, what was the motivation there? Um, just can you briefly touch on your thought process and your goals as far as deciding to go on to a postdoc? So I can start. Uh, when I started my fourth year and I was working on my dissertation, uh, I was already thinking of uh, doing a postdoc after graduation. So I was not specifically looking for faculty positions. Mm -hmm. I felt like I need more time to develop my research interests more. Um, also, it would give me time to publish uh, in the area of my research. And also, maybe work more with other research teams to learn from them, and so that I can be confident <laughs> in my skills and knowledge, and uh, to be able to come up with a research agenda as a full-time faculty. So I feel like I need more time to prepare myself for this goal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I kind of echo that. Yeah, there's a little bit more time to develop as a scholar, um, and this. Um, a doctoral opportunity came along and was just too perfect to turn down. It's interdisciplinary learning and they needed somebody who um, could do research on student creativity development. And I just thought, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't turn it down because it's right in my alley. Um, and I didn't have to move because I was moving anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's about how it was going. Yes. Um, it seems that you're too. Uh, Research problems were a very big part. From your two big problem sets, maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, and the argument being either logical and illogical. Did you come up with those yourself, or were they used on a different way within the same realm previously? For my dissertation, maybe. Uh, maybe the problems, uh, the research questions related to the different phases of my study. The well and the, you know, exactly. well structured and ill structured. Yeah, those seem like key components of your research. Uh, so, well structured and ill structured problems that, uh, yeah, I had two types of those two types that uh, in the game that I designed. Uh, so, the reason behind that uh, was that I wanted, uh, based on the literature that I reviewed, there was a lot of literature on well structured problems, uh, but very little. I would say almost not, not the experiments they explain. So I, I would say almost not because I haven't come across any experiments that specifically brain imaging, uh, that specifically look into ill structured problems. Uh, most of them uh, look at well structured, but for obvious reasons, it's very hard to design an experiment with structured problems that could manipulate features because it's ill structured. So that's why I kind of wanted to incorporate those structures as well and just to, uh, for the future, not for my dissertation, but to compare their performances and also brain activity while they are engaging in these two different, completely different uh, types of problems because it requires different thought processes, well structured versus ill structured. But I'm not sure what the comparison will, will show, whether it's similar brain activity or different. Well, I have some preliminary results that shows that increasing complexity for well-structured problems also increases the mental workload. And that's true not only for well-structured, but also for ill-structured problems. If the ill-structured problem is more complex, the mental workload increases the complexity. So that's kind of one comparison that I was able to uh, track, I mean, to, to, to conduct. Uh, but there are so many other things I think with this experiment, I just didn't have the time, and that was not the main focus of my dissertation. Any other questions? Um, my question is for Elaine. So, last time I was one class in my school, right? So, how would you say that you have the ability to call the problems? And also, um, uh, you asked, are the only books ever in the grade to teach the subjective thinking class? And how would you say the only assumptions are biased? 
Yeah, absolutely. So great question. So um, having six people as part of a, a case study, which is why it's kind of it's grounded in this idea of a case study. So um, looking at this, the unique classroom where it was this one steam class taught by six teachers all at one time. So it allowed me to basically observe more teachers at once, knowing that I'm the only teacher. Um, and yeah, you brought up like one major limitation of the study. And one of the high parts of doing a dissertation, you know, as a one, one person, this is really meant to be like a team. This classroom observations are really meant to be done by teams. Um, and that's the reason is that there's a lot of bias. And so what, what I did, part of the reason why it's mixed methods is I tried to triangulate the data um, and thereby triangulate the analysis of it as well to try to, as best as possible, kind of overcome my own bias. So having them self-assess, having myself kind of do the surveys and then do the interviews and then the, the field notes so that I could bring it all together in, in hopes that it was as, as objective as possible. All right. Uh, any more questions? If they're not, can we thank the speakers one more time? <laughs> Before we leave, I want to give you. Some yeah, thank you. Wow, nice. Cool. Oh, awesome. Please feel free to take food home. Yeah.